were talking about there were some people who really came in the 70s who presented the good urban planning for the developments of the whole cities of Manila, right? Please continue, Carmi. Actually, there were experts from the Philippines. They weren't just foreign experts. Ah. So, um, yeah, so I mentioned there were plans way before. Um, yeah, the Burnham Plan, uh, I think 1905, and um, they call it the Manila Metro Plan from the 1970s. There was an a transport plan in the 90s, they call it the MMUTIS, Metro Manila Urban Transport Study. And well, more recently, there's this Manila Dream Plan that the, the JICA did for the Philippines. So, for example, the plan from 1975, the urban experts from the Philippines, as well as from the UK, and they looked at the whole Metro Manila. And I think it's what's lacking now. Trans we always talk about traffic, we always yes. talk about transport. But it's usually discussed separately from land use. And a lot of our issues is because of that. Like everything's so fragmented. You have local governments that don't have to talk to each other. So a lot of our I think our woes are also because of the local government code. Lack of political will Lack to really political go into will. that. And there's no one really in charge of traffic. It's not clear who's in charge. So, meaning, the reason why we have traffic is right? <laughs> because of the roads? The roads are too narrow? Well, one, some roads actually aren't narrow if you look at it. For mm -hmm. example, what are the roads, our major roads that have traffic? It's Commonwealth, C5, etc. They have several lanes. But we really have to address vehicle volume. Mm -hmm. And the usual reaction for addressing vehicle volume is to build more roads. For example, last year, our car sales increased by 27%. That's huge. Our roads don't increase 27% a year. And um, a lot of um, countries are realizing, and there's actually a study of several uh, U.S. cities, that for every 10% in um, roads that you increase, after 10 years, the number of vehicles that pass through the roads also increases 10%. So it's like a one is to one. So it's really the wrong approach. So what should we mm -hmm. do? One is we should really address um, lessening the number of cars that fly through our streets. Lessen the number of cars that are being sold. Now, we can understand how unpopular that could be because one, we have a car industry. We have a strong car industry in the Philippines. But imported car industries. <laughs> yes. Well, I know some bits of the manufacturing is done here. The big value added is not really in the Philippines anymore like, like it used to, but there are some people who work in the car industry here. Another is, I think a lot of our leaders, and not just government leaders, but business leaders, don't understand how hard it is to not have a car. A lot of us are very dependent on the car. Mm. But if you look at it, we say we're a democratic country and we're supposed to be inclusive. But if you look at the, the projects for transportation, perhaps 80 to 90 percent is addressed for the private car and very little is really for public transport. Um, the numbers are not clear, but you would hear uh, numbers like only 20 to 40 percent of Filipinos own cars. Um, also, for the car owners, 45% of the Filipinos have at least a second car. So Correct. it's really the same people who are... So we have to address travel behavior mm -hmm. and uh, lifestyles. And then people would ask, okay, but if there was public transport, then I would get out of my car, which is a... True. It's, yes. a, it's a real... If you know, it's a bad, public yeah, yeah, if there was a good yeah. public transport... Why can't right? we not have those? Yeah. Because, because of the lack of planning. planning. They should have, when they did this... Uh, this Why that's uh, destined to go out? <laughs> <laughs> you know the population will grow, right, in the future. They should have already improved our railway system, you mm -hmm. know? Like, we have that, uh, that Philippine... Uh, National Railway. Railway. Yes. And I've seen it, that uh, people really ride on it. Oh, there's a caller, Mrs. Mercado. Uh, she would like to join in. Hi, Mrs. Mercado. Our regular caller. Yes. Uh, do you have any <laughs> question or something to tell Miss Carmi? Ah, uh, louder than Carmi. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. Yes, this is an urban planner. The famous architect, giant uh, architect. John Palafox. <laughs> John Palafox. Yes, that's the father, Mr. John Palafox. Well, he, he is an urban planner, he's in private practice, but he gives advice for several years now. For example, the master plan for Metro Manila that I mentioned from the 1970s, he was part of Yeah, no one does it. Because if you talk if you want real solutions for you know related to urban planning, related to transport, related to traffic, it requires compromise. And I think a lot of our leaders hesitate to Yes, good morning. Thank you, Mrs. Marcado. <laughs> yes. So her her first question was about um, the if you have enough agricultural lands. Yeah. I think we do, but they're not very productive agricultural lands. And I mean it goes beyond just identifying lands as agricultural. Um, for example, a lot of um, Our, our uh, farm lads are being threatened for development mm -hmm. and some of them really sh are should be for development already but the whole bureaucracy um, restricts it for example it sometimes it just adds another layer for in terms of signature if you want to go through development but I think if the Department of uh, Agriculture and Agricultural Reform should be more effective they should really look at how to encourage the farmers to be more productive how to make sure they're organized and how to make sure that they have you know proper post harvest facilities proper access to the markets transportation right? transportation yeah talking about that you know that in england if you are a gentleman farmer or a farmer the the government pay you yeah pays, pays every farmer in in uh, in uh, england so You know, I don't mind to be a farmer. I get paid, and they make sure they give me technology, and they support the farmers. Here, it's it's not the case. Like uh, I remember hearing that the average age of farmers in the Philippines is 55. so we don't have a clear succession plan for for our farming industry. And in terms of uh, educational attainment, it's only up to grade four. And uh, I'm told it's a big concern, for example, climate change, because. A lot of our uh, farming here is, uh, you know, the traditional way, and now some farmers are confused. They don't know anymore when to harvest and um, when to plant. So we really need support in that. So in terms of hectareage, it's there, but there's no support in terms of um, making sure they're actually uh, produce people uh, who will also implement yes. right mm -hmm. farming yes. itself. So they should. You, you think you should um, have more Los Banos way, uh, more schools like Los Banos where a lot of kids are learning now to, to study about agriculture. Yes, and I think we have to find a way to make agriculture cool. Yeah. Because yes. if, if, you, if the, you know, the poster man or poster girl for farming is an old person who 
who doesn't have anything to feed his family, it's not very encouraging. Yeah. So we should yeah. encourage uh, the young people to go into farm industry, to fisheries, because that's where money is too. I mean, and how to find linkages? It's not just the farmland. Like how to make sure there's also agro industry uh, happening in areas that, that have the high potential for agriculture. How to make sure, for example, agritourism is also possible. We did, yes. we did a plan for um, Doña Ramelio Sinidad in Bulacan and one of her suggestions was really for agri-tourism mm -hmm. how to make sure you know there are resorts and hotels overlooking farmlands. Yes. I could just imagine like this agro-tourism like you have this beautiful um, lands and with all those beautiful organic tomatoes, organic vegetables and then the whole family can just go there and travel there and eat lunch and just buy the the goodies and the products of, or all the things that are planted there, you know, I think that would be a good idea. Even the Filipinos themselves would like to go to those places. And they have uh, like a Bahay Kubo maybe, you can stay overnight and all around you are all the Bahay Kubo, Kait Multi, all the different vegetables that are being sang in that song. <laughs> and then just pick them up and then you can just start and cook it in there, right? Mm -hmm. And be healthy for three days or something with fresh air. So are you... Uh, uh, that's kind of a rare thing these days, huh? But it would be so great, right? Are you trying to see something in that? We recommend. We have recommended it in a few communities we've worked with that aren't urban. And, you know, it's part of our educating uh, Filipinos that you don't have to be a city to be progressive. Okay. You, you don't have to have modern buildings or a shopping center to be progressive. Yes. So, for example, yeah, we worked with um, the local government, in, that local government in Bulacan or in some, the, some other areas in Zambales, for example. We were showing them examples around the world. For example, Ubud Valley, you have mm. tourists who pay up to $1,000 a night to stay in a resort overlooking rice fields. Mm. We have so many of that in the Philippines. That's true. We are actually an agricultural country. I don't know why we went so much on industrialization. You know, just uh, making our country agricultural. I think we would be self-sufficient already and just minima minimal industrialization. Mm -hmm. Because it's destroying our air, it's destroying our environment actually. Like let's say in Denmark, I can always, always, I love Denmark, I always compare to them. Do you know that Denmark is stopped doing their manufacturing of their own uh, clothing or, or in fashion? They actually take their, 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 how do you call this, clothing materials outside the country because they don't want to destroy their rivers. They don't want to destroy their environment. They said it will be more expensive to correct the damage than immediately when they did the planning, they said they're going to destroy it. So it's so good. Like them, they really uh, think ahead. Mm -hmm. So there are no rivers that are being destroyed in Denmark. But I think it also matches um, you know, their demographics, the, the skills and the industry. For example, in the Philippines, it seems like we, from agriculture, we skipped industry and went straight into services. But a lot of Filipinos aren't educated. So I think in, in many places in the Philippines, we should still encourage industries because it's the easiest way to provide for jobs. Mm. But they don't have to be pollutive industries. There's I'm a way to, yeah, to make sure that they still, you know, the effects on the environment are mitigated. It's so funny about human beings. We depend on air, we depend on water, we depend, depend we on destroy that. Yet we, we poison all of that. Mm -hmm. you know? It's like a slow way of committing suicide. You know? But people don't see it. Mm -hmm. right? where, where, where does that come from, do you think? Lack of planning, lack of vision. Lack of planning, but I think it's short or short sighted. Short -sighted. Short -sighted. Yeah. It's we just always about quick wins. wins. It's always quick, quick wins. wins, which yes. is bad. You know, even before this uh, climate change came in, uh, that we have to be all so aware so fast now or immediately, you know those uh, food industries or like those uh, fast foods, I don't have to mention their names, these big fast foods, when I saw all the plastics that are being thrown, and I was saying, how did they do that? And, and that time they, they didn't have yet all those uh, incinerators or recyclable companies that would recycle those plastics. Mm -hmm. 
and I heard that they used to be buried just under the ground. Mm. And it takes so like how many years for a foam to be, and foam cannot be, be uh, how do you call this, absorbed by the by the soil. Well, it's, it's not biodegradable. It doesn't happen underground. And then now suddenly we are now coming into no more plastics. Mm. Now, but we have the biodegradable plastic still, <laughs> recycled biodegradable plastics as trash cans, you know. But then, so I was just saying, don't they know that? Like, they should have asked these big fast food companies to make, to bring in their own <laughs> recyclable machines. You know what, if you look at our laws, we have supposedly all these laws that protect our water. Yes. We have laws for solid waste. We have one of the most um, well-written laws in the world, and I think we're the first, to have a climate change act. Really? Um, but it's really implementation. Mm. Uh, we have a law about, for example, idle lands tax. If you if your land is idle, you haven't been paying tax, and the government should actually develop it for things that we need to develop, like mm. affordable housing. Mm. Mm. But no for one, farming, even for farming, mm. yeah, in city farming. But, but it's know really that, implementation. Yes. But you know that it's most of these lands are owned by people who are in there, and of course, they're excused. <laughs> yeah, but remember, <laughs> Marcus, uh, President Marcus, uh, before, uh, I know because some of the lands of my grandfathers were taken in for farmers. He had that uh, Republic Act where if these are idle lands, <laughs> they, they will be put to use by farmers who can till them and they would share the 30-70% or 60-40%. But mind you, we were never able to get our 30 uh, was that the beginning It of was the already owned by the farmers that we shared it with. But anyway, but that's just good. Mm -hmm. So I hope they do that again. Yes, I don't like it. Regardless, so regardless who owned them, right? Mm -hmm. well, at the same time, I think we also need to build more forests and where there's a habitat for trees that produce some oxygen. Uh, Are we doing that now? I mean, you're the one traveling, Carmi. More trees. Yeah, well, we, we say that. Not the ones that are surrounded with concrete. You know, yeah. Real trees that are there yeah. to live and continue to live. We see that. If, for example, there's supposed to be no logging right now. Yes. We, know it's we should stop now. It's still doing, right? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I, we would say perhaps you should bring it back. Just allow logging, but make sure it's regulated rather than having so much illegal logging. I mean, you have to plant on. first. Mm -hmm. Like maybe this is one, one tree is for cutting and the other one not. Mm -hmm. So people who would like to be in the logging business should already prepare in a way that they don't destroy mm -hmm. the ecosystem when you just remove everything, you know? And um, for example, we have so many valuable forests, so many valuable watersheds, but sometimes you don't understand what's going on. For example, in the Mar Marikina watershed, it's supposed to be protected. Mm -hmm. And yet apparently, there was a previous president who said that there should be a uh, a socialized housing um, site there mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be protected land or you, you have definitely valuable forests that are being titled so you really have this, this mismatch and, and overlaps of laws of policies mm -hmm. of decisions that seem to not fit a bigger a picture a bigger vision for you know what's good for our future why is it that the Philippines seems to have a lack of long-term vision? Why is it everything so short-term? Is it about a lack of survival? Is it cultural? What is it? Greed? Yeah, it what could be it? many things. Some yeah. say it's ingrained in our culture, but I, I hope not. I think mm. it's something that you know we should be able to fight because we're better educated now. But and more aware yes. of my, what might happen if we continue being like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need you. You know, your dad and um, Eddie, more people who are more conscious when they are planning to build things in, or especially if it's concrete. <laughs> yeah, when you do building here, don't you think that really, can you see that? These are all concrete in front of us, but there's no green. They should have kept some land where the water could uh, yeah, back into the ground. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like looking at us, that's why we have floods. Mm -hmm. We're allowing everyone to build concrete after another. You're not even keeping a, a garden around it. And that's why the ground borders are diminishing. Yes. Also, right? you, know, I mean, you were just talking earlier, I think it was before we even started the show, how the water in your village starts to diminish. I guess less and less water coming out of your faucet. Right? See, there's no urban planning, right? 
guys, we are listening. I mean, the next time one person builds another concrete near your village, your water can be affected, right? So. Mm -hmm. There's actually a the recent engineering solution. They came out with porous concrete. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. It's like you pour that on a street, and so the water, rather than being washed to the side, it still can it be goes into the in ground. A, I'm sorry. There's enough holes in the concrete that the water goes into the ground, mm -hmm. rather than going off to the side or it needs pipes to be carried away. Of course, this only works in, in a climate where it never freezes, which is ideal for in us, Philippines. right? Yeah. What do you think of that, Carmi? Well, that would definitely help, mm. the porous concrete, but another it's is... It's expensive, right? <laughs> I don't know. Not that expensive uh -huh. anymore, yeah. But another thing is, the area required to be open space in developments is very minimal. You only require 30% mm. of... Uh, national government only requires 30% of any property to be open space. Mm -hmm. And the 30% can even be... Uh, concrete, it could be roads, mm. it could be a yeah. parking lot. And here everybody builds like, you can't even see the light of day between two buildings. Right? Okay, Carmi, there's another color. Uh, mm. We're allowing everyone to build concrete after another. You're not even keeping a, a garden around it. And that's why the ground borders are diminishing. Yes. Also, right? you, know, I mean, you were just talking earlier, I think it was before we even started the show, how the water in your village starts to Diminish, I guess, less and less water coming out of your faucet. Right? See, there's no armor mining, right? Guys, we are listening. I mean, the next time one person builds another concrete near your village, your water can be affected, right? So, mm -hmm. there's actually a the recent engineering solution. They came out with porous concrete. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. It's like you pour that on a street, and so the water, rather than being washed to the side, it still can it be goes into the in ground. A, I'm sorry. There's enough holes in the concrete that the water goes into the ground, mm -hmm. rather than going off to the side or it needs pipes to be carried away. Of course, this only works in, in a climate where it never freezes, which is ideal for in us, Philippines. right? Yeah. What do you think of that, Carmi? Well, that would definitely help, mm -hmm. the porous concrete, but another it's is... expensive, right? <laughs> I don't know. Not that expensive uh -huh. anymore, yeah. But another thing is the area required to be open space in developments is very minimal. You only require 30% mm -hmm. of... Uh, national government only requires 30% of any property to be open space. Mm -hmm. And the 30% can even be uh, concrete, it could be mm -hmm. roads, it could be a yeah. parking lot. And here everybody builds like... You can't even see the light of day between two... Okay, we should all be mad, but... We keep electing the same kind I of know, leaders. I know, right? And we shouldn't blame it all on government. From Private us to sector has Maybe we are mad that. because we keep repeating or voting for so the same people. So, Maharlan, you should not vote people. again for those people who are not urban minded We are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are annihilated, actually, by our bad urban planning. <laughs> and I think June Palafox has advised 38 or more than 38 countries about their traffic and urban planning. and. The only country is a country that is not listening to him is Philippines. Oh my gosh! Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> but that's why I'm telling Carmi here and the dad to please make it their advocacy not to give up on us. Yeah, please don't give up on us here. They haven't just tried, they have, they have. No, actually, we're, we're doing a lot even. We're supposed to be a private company, but we're actually uh, working on training people who want to become urban planners. So mm -hmm. we've actually gone around the Philippines and trained. You know, a lot of... We have 1,600 uh, municipalities in the Philippines, but we have less than 1,000 urban planners. So a lot of uh, local governments don't have proper urban, urban planners mm -hmm. that plans. And it's easy to understand why they're not compensated well and there aren't enough planning schools. So I think it's one thing we should do as well. We should empower local planners. And you know, it's not all bad news. There are some local leaders that we work with that do urban plans. Mm. So we, we focus on them. Everyone should have a heart to really be a part in developing our country, you know. Whether you're a senior citizen, whether you are uh, in the youth council, whether we are in the corporate or in the Rotary clubs or what other clubs you are in, every Filipino, I think, you know, should catch you not like uh, they, they travel everywhere, most of us, you know, and 
don't we see what's good in that country? And then sometimes we just become bystander in our, in our own country. We just complain, 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 but don't even write or put in the social media what the things that may be uh, needed to improve. And as an individual, you can start it at home. You can, start with, you can start with your communities. That For example, too. we have residential subdivisions as big as cities. So they should start, they should create their own bus system rather than all of them each traveling to Makati, traveling Talking to about Russia. that, you know what, Carmi? The, the, the school where my daughter go, goes, the cars, the traffic that goes into Das Marias, Colleges mm -hmm. University. Mm -hmm. I said, why doesn't the school just make a bus like in America where you're just picked up somewhere in a corner and then let your kid go ride in that bus instead of uh, just parent picking, parent up, picking up. And we do. Although yeah. with good reason, um, for example, yesterday I, I was asked, there was a forum with uh, TV5 mm -hmm. about um, traffic. And uh, someone said, oh, we can't really walk or take public transport because it's so hot. So I mentioned my own study when I was doing my master's in urban planning in the UK. I studied about pedestrianization in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So I found out the number one reason was actually lack of security. It wasn't uh, because it was hot or it rains in the Philippines. Well, the so, buses are not really safe. Right? Well, that's, yeah, the that's buses the aren't safe and you're not sure if you'll get home in one piece and mm -hmm. someone won't rob you. But maybe it starts with schools. Yes, we could start with schools. So, well, another risk. I was going to say that we should really push for security. So start with schools, start with barangay level, make sure mm -hmm. that you know there's an effort for security. They should really invest in making our cities more secure. Mm -hmm. in, and you know how to do that? I think they should have more CCTVs in every yes, corner. Because in Monte Carlo, even if you're scratching your butt or put, uh, cleaning your nose, it's all in CCTV, every corner of Monte Carlo. So it's so safe, like they know right away who did what. Monte Carlo is a very small place, yeah, it's a very rich But place. there's a sign of Metro Manila, so small, Makati. And big Tennessee. schools should have transport plans. Yes! So I studied in it's Brooks University, it's in Oxford, so it's a very small city, also mm. where Oxford University is. And um, each of us students is required to sign a contract that we will never bring a car to school. Wow. But instead, the schools, the two big schools, have a transport plan. So they know the way of transport that people come into the schools. And then they encourage clustering. So, you know, for school buses, for carpooling. Yes, and I like that, the carpooling clustering among them. So I think all our big schools that cause traffic should do that. Yeah, I was already thinking, sometimes I see uh, students were where they also go to Kolea and said, shall I take them? Maybe I should just be the bus mother for this five, you know, instead of five of them mm -hmm. going. I said, we should go back to that again, I think. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's one way, one small way, way of uh, reducing cars coming out of the villages, right? And they should yes. never be picked up on the street where they're blocking our traffic, you know? There should be something on the campus grounds. If anything, if somebody gets picked up, they should be picked up on the ground. Because what I see right now, for example, at Don Bosco in Baltimore, it's a it's a yeah, because they traffic see hell, they have, right? Uh, Every time they pick up the the students, even though they have lots of buses lined up, it's still terrible. Yeah, the you know? Don Bosco is the wrong planning. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge. So they say you, say you can go in and we can Probably, we can bring yeah, all the still, buses in it. Still, they're using public streets for all yeah, that, they do. blocking they do. it all. They do. they do. Yeah, and I'm sure the other schools are not any better. Mm. Yeah. So what do you think? We can start with schools, right? We should. We should start Even with colleges. Schools, yeah, but Ateneo, for courses. example, they have all the cars. They all the students have their own cars. Why can't Ateneo have their own? Uh, I heard Ateneo is actually doing something about transport. I don't mm. know the details, but I know they're, they're, they've started. Yeah, I think Kanipunan's a mess because of Yeah, that, right? that's true. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and Mariano. Is it Mariano? No, Miriam. Miriam, Miriam. Miriam, Miriam, Miriam Collins. Miriam yeah. Collins. Yes, uh, Kanipunan's a mess. It's, and sometimes it's, it's a all in my issue for, for schools everywhere. Imagine. I don't go to Ateneo. I don't let my daughter go there, even she's uh, a scholar there. Because like it's too far away, you know, for her to wake up 4 o'clock in the morning just to be on time. So, La Salle, another thing is La Salle also. Everybody has their own cars. So, these big schools should have their own private safe buses. 
you know, where there's a security guard in, uh, in the bus, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, not just safe as in security guard, also they should be crash safe in case something happens, like a crash, right? Because most of these little, uh, no, I don't like, like pickups, right? They, no, they I like the proper big bike. buses, like just, America just School like Express. Absolutely friends. zero cushion when the bus gets hit. There's like a piece of sheet metal, and then there's the child. You know, there's no security, no safety if in, in case of an accident. Yeah, no, I would like this None. kind of small buses, Zero. right? Yeah. Those little vans. It should yeah. be the real big buses. Yeah. Although so they unsafe, would still be better yeah. than a car each per student. Yes. Yeah, in terms of uh, traffic, but not in terms of safety. Yeah, yeah for in terms of safety, we have those big... You have kids, like, Carmen? No. Are you married? No. No? Boyfriend? I My friends. Know, everybody <laughs> wouldn't be asking me these questions. Yeah, yeah, I'm not I'm not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when you have your own kids, I think you start thinking a little different, you know, about the, the security issues about uh, children. You know. Yeah. So what else? What can we do? Well, one is, um, if we're complaining, if we're ever complaining about traffic, and we're sitting in a car mm. in traffic, <laughs> you're part of the problem. So first, before you get in your car, assess, do I really need to take a car in this trip? And earlier I said that um, a lot of our traffic is caused by the imbalances. So houses are too far from schools or too far from places <coughs> of work. Yeah. So we should encourage, uh, I mean, it's already old school planning to have very uh, low density uh, villages, like hundreds of hectares with no other uh, uses there. For example, if you live in a village, you just need to buy bread, you have to get up, drive your car, and get yeah, out. That's true. So we have to assess our neighborhoods, our communities, if they're, they encourage that kind of lifestyle, like a very mm -hmm. car-oriented lifestyle. So, I think uh, there's a healthy happening right now, it's kind of a technical revolution, and uh, with, the, with the oncoming of uh, Uber and such services, I think it takes a lot of cars off the road, because with the regular taxis, they have to drive to find passengers. Uber doesn't. They can just stay parked. Yeah. They don't, there's no pollution. There's no more traffic. They don't add to traffic if they don't have passengers. They only add to traffic if they have passengers. In the U.S., they found that every car that's available for a car share, such mm -hmm. as Uber, it lessens the demand for buying cars by up to 12 to 46. Wow. But so probably the car industry doesn't like that, right? <laughs> or don't like that. Although here, because cars are becoming cheaper, some actually blame these car sharing companies for the increase in car sales because now people are buying more small cars for, for use yeah. for Uber as business. And for the old cars, one of the guys said the, all the 20 years and older cars should be out. Well, personally, yes. I'm not going to buy a second car because now I have Uber. And you know, mostly Uber is available. Sometimes with an extra rate, but it's available, and so I don't need to buy an extra car. I don't have to buy, uh, worry about gassing up the car, checking the tire pressure, checking the oil, buying insurance, getting the car maintained, you know, all the, waiting in line at the car dealership, picking up the car. You know, I don't have to do any of these things. I can just get Uber, and it's cheaper if I add it up, even in the month, than just the car payment alone. It's not much. More so if I add car maintenance and the inconveniences and all that, and the gasoline and insurance, right? So I think that that's going to take some of the traffic out. How about those know? people now, parking think, on the streets? I think we need to get the regular taxis on a similar system, so they don't also have to go chase customers by yes. driving around because that adds a lot to traffic. Actually, right? there are so many uh, models we could look at. Mm -hmm. For example, um, in Japan. Uh, you only get to buy a car if you can show uh, proof of a parking space. Mm. So let's assess our own homes. If you only have a one-car garage, you should just have one car. Mm. If you have a two-car garage, then you should just have two. two cars. And a lot of us have so much more than what our own garages can mm. can have. Personally, I want a six-car garage. I don't have a bad one. That's what I want. <laughs> Another is we also don't follow traffic rules. and. A lot of uh, developments get away with not following rules. For mm -hmm. example, we shouldn't have parking spaces on street corners. But you That's see a lot true. of restaurants and cafes that have parking slots in, in street corners. Yeah, yeah. Um, also in um, Singapore, before you can go to a store and, and buy a car, you have to first show a, a license to own the car and use the road. Mm -hmm. So And they auction this. So in the last auction, 
it was something like 2 million pesos. So that's just your license to buy a car, it's not the car itself. And because of that, and because they limit the number of years when you could use a car, they know how many cars will be on the road the next 10 years. So they match the road um, capacity mm -hmm. with What that. do you mean by that license? It's, it's that they a license to own a car. And how do they qualify them? It's, it's auctioned out. Wow! Yeah, it's bid out. Like, if I don't want a car, okay, I have the, the, the right to have it because I have a family, but I'm, we're not going to buy, so here's my license. No, it's, it's a separate, it's not a driver's license, it's a license. To no, I know, car. like, I can, I can get that privilege. Like, yeah. it's a privilege. If you don't need it, then you don't buy a license. Yes, and but then you can give it to somebody else. If you have one already, And yes, it can be auctioned yes. for money? Yes. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, yeah, but it's very expensive. It could cost you hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, but that's why. Yeah. But, but again, people would say they're able to do that because they have an efficient bus system, mm -hmm. yeah. yes, that's true. train that's true. system. What about these people? We have parking issues in Manila. Those various people, they, they reserve their own private parking spot on public streets. You see that a lot yeah. here in the Philippines. I've never seen that. it anywhere else yeah. in the world. But here they get away with it. They block the parking spot the whole day where a lot of people could park for 20 minutes, an hour, but they park, block it the whole day just because they want to park there overnight. You know, that, I think that just adds to all the problems. I think the, our, our it's, it's kind of traffic police are yeah. trying to really get those uh, cars being parked in places where especially it's used for traffic. So, you know, I think they're starting to well, do well, that. This may not necessarily be illegal to park there, but why, why is it possible that people can privatize their public parking? You know, on they, public streets. On public yeah, streets. Be yeah. That should not be allowed. Yeah. So, I think that just makes things it's worse. Practice, it's very have, you, have you suggested that to the, to the well, cities you've talked to? Or well, not officials you've talked we to? have suggested it actually for um, governments we've worked with, mm. uh, but I have yet to see it implemented. Mm. Have not, no. Have not. Because they themselves, uh, the one who's implementing, are their, they, those are their, their private cars being parked. Perhaps, yeah. So, uh, what else? What else can we do for a better... I think, we need to, I think there's a certain level of uh, uh, focus on the self. If we could operate more like in looking not just how we can benefit ourselves, but benefit the whole community, I think the country would move forward much faster, mm -hmm. right? Rather than, oh, i got to reserve this parking spot for 24 hours because I need it from 6 o'clock in the evening until 6 o'clock in the morning. Now, there's 12 hours this parking spot's blocked with nobody using it. For what? For purely selfish reasons. You know, yeah. For nothing else. So yes. more planning and organization, right, Carmi? Yes. So what else can you say, Carmi? How else can we make a better place for Manila? <laughs> Well, one is um, there's so many uh, agencies and authorities in Manila, but there's no clear one leader. Mm. So earlier, before the show started, I remember we were talking about how we need a metropolitan government. government. Mm. And uh, that metropolitan government should be empowered to also be uh, integrated with leadership over the airport, mm. over the seaport. So over the traffic, over land use. Because currently, um, it's the mayors who have authority over the land use. For roads, it's really not clear. For example, EDSA, it's supposed to be, it's a national highway, but uh, the lights, it's up to the city governments. Uh, mayors are allowed to give rally permits along EDSA. So it's very fragmented. So there really needs to be clear leadership at the metropolitan level. So a unified, yes. uh, how do you call this, uh, decision whenever things has to be done, right? So it should come from a government, just like I said during, maybe you're still a baby, <laughs> when the first lady was the governor, first lady Marcus was a governor, and she was the one implementing how to make Philippines better, or yes. Manila look better. Yes. And all the other um, metropolitan areas could do this, for example, there's a Metro Iloilo Gimaras Economic Council, so it would be good if they're empowered more to be really a, you know, a full authority, not just a You know your dad should be the first governor of that Metro Manila. You know, speaking of Gimaras and Iloilo, there's so many gorgeous old buildings in Iloilo. What's, what's your point of view of um, we should keep it. maintaining the history of the Philippines? Because it seems like it's deteriorating, yeah. it's falling apart, it's being torn down for... 
for commercial purposes, uh, isn't that a, a huge loss to the country yes. and the culture it, it and is. to our future generations? Look what happened to Inupazor. Singson was able to, mm -hmm. I mean... Because there's no clear support. For example, there really aren't um, too many heritage um, experts in the Philippines. There are some who may claim, but you know, uh, we really need more uh, heritage uh, experts. Mm -hmm. um, one is we don't we should be have incentives. For example, in other countries, if you're a heritage structure, you're given incentives by government. You're actually even given a professional to help you uh, redevelop your building. Let's say you want to put a cafe in an old house and things like that. But here it's so expensive. And another is there are no clear guidelines. For example, um, it. It was in the news uh, last year, but we're the architects of the Army Navy Club. Um, I mean, there were some things that perhaps shouldn't have been done, but there was no clear guidelines to begin with, mm -hmm. no clear guidance guidance from the government. Mm -hmm. So I think even the caller earlier mentioned um, Torre de Manila mm -hmm. of DNCI. I mean, we could all have our opinions about it, but why didn't the guidelines come first? All right, because we're we're discouraging people from investing, from you know, pouring in money into our, our economy. We do need housing units. We do need investments into our cities. So we should have clear guidance first before ostracizing someone mm -hmm. when it's too late That's and they true. put in a lot of money. So can you help us in that? How about you you try to give us some some of the things like you've said? We should be an organization where in what are to be implemented. The, the city governments should be doing this already. I think again that's one of the things that's they don't know better because they're not architects and they're not engineers. So yes, maybe look at Manila. I think that's why it's um, very complicated because when you have the NHI, the national, um, the group that's in charge of national heritage or the NCCA, mm. but they don't uh, coordinate quite closely with the Manila government. So if there are heritage zones in Manila, they should uh, have a clear system for permits, for example. Because the, the mayor has the power to give permits. And then it's too late in the game when, where so, the Heritage Commission says, oops, you shouldn't be... So we this. have a national heritage... We have one. How do you call it? National Heritage Institute? or Yes. Institute. Mm -hmm. And the NCAA, what is that? NCCA. Uh, NCAA. So I remember right, National Commission for Culture and Arts. Oh, but so we have to coordinate better with the local governments because development permits aren't from NHI or NCCA, they're from city governments. So permits should now from now on go to the NHI. Actually, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really ironic because uh, red tape is terrible mm, in the Philippines. As it is, no. We have so many layers to, to get a permit and yet these things happen. Mm. So, you know, one thing we always suggest is to have transparency. I mean, yeah. it's the age of social media, oh, of yeah. innovation and technology. So we, one of the recommendations we always say is all local governments should have in their website um, all the planning permissions being submitted by developers. So, and then perhaps give a timeline. If it's say in two months and there are no complaints but they have complied all the requirements of NHI, of all these other agencies that need to give an opinion, yeah. then they should be given a, a permit. But now it's, you know, it's actually difficult to be a developer as well if you want to be an honest uh, developer mm -hmm. because you have to go through so many and takes. it's not clear how much money you'll spend, it's not clear how long it is that you'll get a <laughs> permit. So we need organization development for a new government. <laughs> all your, all the experts should do reorganization mm -hmm. for all the governments, as you said, uh, and... Uh, Please uh, keep those in mind. Put it in a black and white, please. So maybe when uh, we have a new government, we can already. She, we've, they're all in black and white. You can actually Google these recommendations. Already? Yes, and we'll keep updating our, our website. Where can we find it in your website? Um, our websites are palafoxassociates.com and palafoxarchitecture.com. Mm -hmm. So you'll also find links there to previous articles that. Uh, my father has written, and he has a column in Manila Times, and I have a column in mm -hmm. The Standard. Mm -hmm. So there, guys, now uh, it's a bit clearer to me. So those uh, agencies, or like the local governments, it's the mayor who gives the permit, right? Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> it should, uh, uh, before they give permits to, to builders, 
the NHIs would be there, yes. and the water, how do you call these people who are in charge of the water system? Especially when you're building a certain age or older, because I've heard of a, a city where uh, they had a, a group of Spanish villas, right? And they were donated to the city for preservation, and then the city promptly sold them for some commercial development. To me, that's heartbreaking. You know, so, such things, to me, is just disgusting in a way. You know, El mm -hmm. is so nice, you know, they have that heritage, mm -hmm. uh, Spanish mm -hmm. time, uh, time homes in Vigan. It's really so, so impressive, mm -hmm. and it's good. Now, it's a center and it, it for tourism, right? It attracts yes, tourism, yes. right? It attracts tourism, right? And it doesn't mean you have to have either or. Yeah. When you look at it in Shanghai, at the Bund, they, they had these old, old buildings, but they, they core them out and they build a whole new inside. Right, kind of modern structure on the inside, but kept the facade. Good so on. you have both, you know, you can have both, it's possible. Oh, yeah. it's so interesting. It's so interesting. It's yeah. already 1.30, so please, I give you the time, Carmi. Uh, so, please say, what can you tell to the future, yeah, the future politicians of this country? Well, one is really encourage uh, local government and national government leaders to invest in urban plans. Mm. I mean, it's really important. It's a it's a worthy investment because it's so sad that a lot of uh, public funds are being wasted on infrastructure on projects that don't help the bigger picture. Not so true. So we really recommend uh, investing in urban plans. Um, there are urban planners in the Philippines. Make sure there are registered urban planners. It's called an environmental planner. The members of the Philippine Institute of Environmental Planners. I'm currently uh, vice president of the group. And really, it's a way to make sure that uh, resilience is considered, uh, jobs are considered, and the bright potential of the cities and municipalities are developed. Mm. Yes, and above all, to make sure that it's good for the end users. You know, I think it even health. saves money, right? Because I, I live in a part of Makati where they're just putting uh, drainage pipes in. But why you have to rip open the streets already, you can put all those ugly cables in at the same time. And right? it's not just right. leaders yeah. in government, but private sector as well, property owners should also consider this urban planning whenever yes. they do okay. Because it raises property prices, right? Yeah. Oh, value, right? Sorry, thank you so much for giving the wow. last two minutes. So excited. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Carmi. Yeah, yeah, thank you a lot. Thanks for this good discussion. The more, uh, if I one day have the, the opportunity to be with those uh, government and so we'll have your father here. Hopefully we'll tell them to yes. get in touch with Palafox and Associates. Thank you. <laughs> thank good you, afternoon. thank you. And good afternoon, Philippines. Stay tuned for Equal Justice.